They're massive beasts, pumped up to the max for the ultimate thrill. Fans look at it, monster truck drivers and trucks as superheroes, as something bigger than life. With mega attitude that drives these behemoths to incredible highs and lows. I think the thing that people get excited about is just seeing something get tore up. And still, these giants are full of shocking surprises. Monster trucks, by their design, are intended to fly. Pop the hood, get behind the wheel, and discover the birth of a mechanical marble. Around the world, millions of otherwise sane people are absolutely crazy about monster trucks. They fill stadiums in search of the roar, the energy, the spectacle, and their favorite champions. You don't see big things like that get to go as fast, and you just don't expect something that big to go that hard. But there's more going on here than a passion for ear-splitting noise. Behind every mega machine is a monster loaded with cutting-edge technology. Maybe people who don't really know much about our sport, you know, they got this idea that we're a bunch of rednecks out here or messing with our big trucks with our big tires. Yeah, don't drop it, There's some pretty ingenious people behind the scenes in this. These trucks have come a long ways over the years. My truck definitely is nothing compared to these. How does a monster truck compare to a pickup? Let's take a look. Your standard pickup is six feet tall and six and a half feet wide. A monster truck is four feet taller and a full six feet wider. The weight? Your pickup is just under 4,000 pounds. A monster truck? At least 10,000 pounds, including more than 2,000 pounds in tires alone. And power? Well, you don't even want to go there. Your typical pickup is about 230 horsepower. A monster truck? 1,500 horsepower with an acceleration of 0 to 60 in 3 seconds. People do not realize that they have an acceleration rate um, second to, to none. I mean, these things really move. And topping that off, some monster trucks can jump 30 feet high and turn on a dime, survive heart-stopping rollovers, and of course, demolish everything in their path. Center for Automotive Research Director Giorgio Rizzoni. Monster trucks are extreme vehicles. You've essentially taken each one of the characteristics of the vehicle to its limit. Everything is larger, stronger, sturdier. We've done everything you can think of with them. Of course, crush cars and race with them over dirt obstacles, do wheel stands. They are tremendously agile, powerful, graceful. But the best way to discover the amazing technologies behind these monster machines is to get under the hood and build one for yourself. That's what they're doing here at the epicenter of monster truck mania, Bigfoot 4x4 in St. Louis, Missouri. My name's Roy Hooser. I'm the chief mechanic here at Bigfoot 4x4. Roy's been working on monster trucks for 25 years. In this garage, he calls the shots. This truck we're building is Bigfoot 16. It's going to be our best truck ever. It's, it's going to be a race truck. Their race truck, which will cost them about $75,000 for parts alone, will have hydraulic rear steering for maneuverability, nitrogen shocks for durability, and a top-of-the-line fuel-injected racing engine. The only problem is this new truck has got to be ready for action in exactly 10 weeks. Just in time for one of the biggest monster truck events of the year, the Vermont Four-Wheel Jamboree. Obviously, we can't send something out that's not what we feel 100% able to do the show. We've got our driver's safety at stake. Wow, look at that turn. Oh, my goodness. Terrific turn for Bigfoot. The first thing that comes to my mind when people mention Monster Truck, I think of Bigfoot because he's pretty much started it all.
Indeed, he did. It all started in 1974 when Bob Chandler, a St. Louis contractor with a knack for auto mechanics, began tinkering with his Ford pickup. To me, I, the, the bigger tires you could put on a truck, the more I liked it because it looked more massive and it would get me more places when I went off road. I kept putting bigger tires on the truck. My general manager called me Bigfoot because I couldn't keep my foot out of the throttle. Bob settled on 66 inch tractor tires and passed his nickname on to the truck. Bigfoot began drawing crowds to Bob's auto shop and the word started to spread. It drew a lot of attention. He kept working on his truck and building it up. And somebody called it a monster truck and the name stuck. Two years later, Bob was still tinkering with his mega machine when he had an idea for a bold experiment. Little did anyone realize, out in a field near the shop, Bob was about to take monster trucks to a whole new level. He went out one morning and drove over these cars, and it was very simple. It just drove right over the top of them. I came around back and drove up again and stopped on top of them. Uh, promoter saw it and said, I want you to do it in front of a crowd. But this was no ordinary crowd. This was a huge truck pull event in front of the packed Pontiac Silverdome in Michigan, the heartland of Motor America. The ultimate fans, the perfect crowd to evaluate the merits of any mechanical marvel. They had 68,000 people at the Pontiac Silverdome. They set the cars up for me. I went out and he kind of went around behind the cars and drove up on them and stopped. The crowd just literally went nuts. And 30,000 people come over the walls. I mean, it just surrounded us. The car crush rocked the motor world. In a blaze of lights, Bigfoot and monster trucks entered the collective psyche of America. Soon, other truck builders and thrill seekers began emulating Bigfoot, and a new industry emerged. I used to mud race. I used to street race with drag cars. Uh, wanted something with a little more pizzazz, a little more wild, a little more excitement. So I went into, you know, monster trucks. Back at the shop, Roy and his team are assembling the first critical component of Bigfoot 16. Over the next 10 weeks, they'll install axles, suspension system, steering, engine, the body, and the tires. But right now, it's all about the chassis. It's the backbone of any vehicle, and for a 10,000-pound monster truck, it's got to be reinforced for maximum strength. A tube chassis has diagonal braces that make it stronger in parts where it needs to be stronger. But it wasn't always that way. Starting off, monster trucks were very fragile. I mean, you could barely drive over cars and hope you didn't hurt something. Uh, most of the chassis were a two and a half or a five-ton military frame, which is just the standard truck frame. Standard frames were heavy. And worse yet, once competitive high-speed racing began, they wore it up to the incredible stress monster trucks put on their frames. I rolled my truck over a hundred times. It's going over, oh, hit the brakes, whoa! You know, you're done. You're on the roof, you're climbing out, it's done. You hear fiberglass crunching, metal kinking, you hear all that. Monster trucks are even capable of forward rollovers, as seen at a 1985 Indianapolis, Indiana monster truck show when Bigfoot driver Jim Cramer pushed a steel frame chassis to its absolute limit. It's the finals, you know, we want to win this thing. The back end hit a car, knocked me up, I'm going toward the stands. And the truck straight up and down on the front wheels. People talk about time slowing down, in a stressful situation, something happens. To me, it was like five minutes, even though it happened in a split second. I was able to wiggle out of the truck before it caught fire, and I come out of there with some glass in my eyes, and that was it, but I was safe. Jim Cramer is a very lucky man to have been able to walk away from that one. It totally flattened that cab out flatten the bed out. That's when we were convinced that we have to do something different about the roll cage. In 1988, monster truck builder and driver Dan Patrick believed he had a solution. 
Using two-inch hollow steel tubing, he welded together a next-generation chassis that was both super strong and 4,000 pounds lighter. Since that day, Dan's company, Patrick Enterprises, has built more than 70 chassis. His design is considered the monster truck industry standard. At any given event, usually 50% of the, the trucks that compete are Patrick Enterprises chassis. The chassis we put out today are about 700 feet of tubing. Today, he's creating a custom chassis for a new Hulk-themed monster truck. Dan's design is dense with crossbars, especially within the roll cage, the foam-padded vertical extension of the chassis that surrounds the driver. This is the roll cage up on the main frame. We have X bracing that goes in each corner of the rear loop down to the frame. So if a truck rolls over and hits in that corner, that load, that impact is actually going all the way down to the frame. The roll cage's main objective is to protect the driver from the impact of a crash and make sure he's not thrown from the vehicle. For competitors in traditional one-on-one -on -one races, Dan's innovation meant greater speed and safety. And for those who wanted to push the technology, it paved the way for a new form of competition called freestyle, a series of wild stunts that still bring the crowds to their feet today. It's like standing in line for ice cream. The racing's standing in line. The ice cream is freestyle. But I just like to cut it loose, let the people, let the fans see what they want to see, and that's freestyle. Next, how do you shockproof a monster truck to survive the impact from a 200-foot jump? At Bigfoot 4x4 outside St. Louis, Missouri, the build of Bigfoot 16, their next great monster truck, is underway. It's slated to make its debut at a national racing event in Vermont in just seven weeks and head mechanic Roy Hooser and his team are just getting started. Okay, let me, I'm gonna lift it up to you and pull the, the cart out from under there. They finished the welded steel chassis. Next, they need to install the axle, the steel rod that delivers power from the engine to the wheels. I wonder why I need to see a chiropractor. Since monster trucks first laid rubber to dirt, the axles were due for a major upgrade. After the first change I made on the truck, which was the tires, the bigger tires, uh, I found out the next weak link on the truck was the axles. I kept breaking axles. As engine power increased and the trucks took on more extreme maneuvers, the stress on the axles mounted. Even a five-ton military axle designed for a massive military troop transport vehicle failed when it faced the extreme power of a monster truck. And our mechanics took this truck and beefed up the axle so much, and this axle was massive. But we'd still take that truck out, jump 15 cars, and land on the front end and split the housing. It's a lot of force. Given Bigfoot's reputation for stomping and crushing, you'd think that impact caused most of the brakes. Surprisingly, the real problem was rotational force, also known as torque. Instead of moving an object linearly, torque is a force that causes an object to rotate. But cutting down on that force only meant losing power. The secret to saving axles was redistributing the force through an innovative technology called a planetary gear. This is the planetary unit. This is what you see here, and this is what we'd put on to reduce the load on the axle. The axle shaft runs through the middle of the housing and drives a set of gears inside the planetary hub. The planetary gear is named for the three gears that orbit its center. Placing the interlocking gears of the planetary inside the wheel took the pressure off the axle. This will turn three times to the ring gears one. So each time this gear turns three times, this gear turns one time. And there was another big plus to the planetaries. They stepped up the horsepower and delivered a new surge of power. 
you're starting out at 1,500 horsepower at the motor, you multiply that through your ratio, and that makes some serious power at the end. And that's why these trucks go as fast as they do. The planetary is what saved the monster truck business completely. Without the planetary, we couldn't run these trucks. Back at the build, Roy and his crew are running into a major glitch installing one of the planetary gears on their Bigfoot 16. No matter how they adjust it, it just won't align properly with the axle. Can we try to turn the pinion or you think you're there? No, we're not even, even there yet. Won't push it at all. defective part, they could reorder it. But this build has a hard deadline, the four-wheel jamboree in just six weeks. They can't afford to lose a day. They get back to basics and resort to a crowbar. It sets things right. <laughs> that one's stubborn. With the chassis built and the axles and planetary gears in place, the build is back on track. But the preparation for the race is far from over. Next, they need to work on the technologies that allow monster trucks to make bone-crushing landings, the suspension system. These are the shocks. When the wheels travel over bumps in the road or lose contact with the ground, the suspension is the mechanism that steadies the vehicle and dampens the vibrations. If you didn't have a sufficient amount of uh, uh, damping, the uh, vehicle would be bouncing on the wheels and it would be very difficult for the driver to regain control of the vehicle quickly. In early monster trucks, the dampening was done by thin stacked metal layers that bent to absorb impact, called leaf springs. They attach to the axle with the U-bolts right here, and the body sits on top. The body will move up and down by the amount of leaf springs you have and what kind of bumps you hit, basically. But leaf springs lacked dampening power to handle monster trucks catching air and colliding with the ground. The thing would hit, and the tires would compress and bounce you six feet back off the ground. We would bounce around so much we couldn't keep our feet in the pedals. The vehicles and the drivers had reached their breaking point. We were doing so much with the trucks, hurting drivers, we felt we had to make a change. In 1988, monster truck builders started experimenting with a whole new type of suspension system. Front and rear shocks made up of hollow cylinders filled with compressed nitrogen gas. Okay, this is the shock absorbers. This is what actually makes the suspension work. These paired cylinders are joined at the top with a small tube. The piston is pushed up inside the cylinder. Oil is displaced and flows into the adjacent cylinder. The oil comes through, through this side, down into this chamber, and this is the nitrogen chamber. It's here that the displaced oil pushes down against the reservoir of nitrogen gas, 400 pounds of it. And as the oil pushes the nitrogen puck down, that's compressing the nitrogen. This is the cushion of the shock. Nitrogen shocks allow monster trucks an unbeatable resistance to the impact of racing on rugged terrain and landing skyscraping jumps. They're six times more powerful than the first monster truck suspension systems. It's all about shock absorption. If you can absorb a major impact, you're not going to bend parts, you're not going to break wheels off, you're just going to, you're going to land it. In Smyrna, Tennessee, in September 1999, Bigfoot driver Dan Runty tested the limits of nitrogen shock technology. We'd never done anything like that before. We'd done long jumps, but to put something of that magnitude out there and, and you know, jump over it was just a totally different deal. I mean, People were looking at us like, you're crazy, it ain't gonna work. To clear the top of the 14-foot-high 727 airplane, Dan knew he had to build up enough speed and hit the ramp just right. But the more speed, the harder the landing. We are back 300 foot from the ramp, and it was a 4-foot by 12-foot ramp. I hit it as hard as the truck would go. Uh, I hit the ramp just shy of 7. I looked down and seen the tail section down there. That's when I realized 
It might be going just a little fast for this one. The super speed allows Dan to clear the top of the plane with room to spare. But can the shocks take the pressure of the landing? Rough ride. Wow. It looks like it's right here. Two hundred and two feet. Two hundred and two feet. Yeah. We got a new record here, Alan. Two hundred and two feet. Furthest we have ever jumped a monster truck. But definitely, we need Guinness out here. We jumped two hundred and two foot. We bounced another hundred on the first bounce. Somewhere between 30 and 35 foot of air underneath the tires at the highest point. You know, and it was a rough landing. I mean, I actually, I bruised my inside because of the hit we took. The landing would have been flat out impossible without nitrogen shocks. <laughs> Next up. The surprising secret behind the monster truck's fierce 1,500 horsepower engine that makes lightning speed possible. At Bigfoot 4x4, Bigfoot 16 is taking shape with a chassis, axles, and a nitrogen charged suspension system. But it's far from race worthy, and the Vermont finals are in just five weeks. When Bigfoot 16 hits the track, the engine could be the difference between the validation of victory or the humiliation of defeat. We first started racing at the 250 foot courses, seven and a half, eight seconds it would be a competitive pass. Now a competitive pass in 250 feet is about 4.8 seconds. Early monster truck engines only generated about 700 horsepower. And at any time, they could stall out and leave a driver stranded on the track. The problem was the mechanism that feeds the engine fuel, the carburetor. So as the trucks jostle around, um, the fuel is sloshing around in the bowls and stuff. So the truck is dying in the air. Traditional carburetors relied on gravity to get fuel into the engine. But monster trucks defied gravity. On the way down from a jump, the fuel was drawn away from the passage that feeds the engine. So that's when we decided that we have to go with the positive fuel system, which is fuel injection. In a fuel injection system, the injector pump forced fuel directly into the intake manifold, where it mixed with air, then on to the combustion chamber. The system constantly fed the engine fuel, even when the truck was soaring through the air. Whether you're on your side, near your top, or wherever, when you hit the accelerator, you have instant RPM. It just ran so much better over the obstacles, it didn't cut out. It was a lot more stable engine, so everybody started to inject their engines. Well, that raised the horsepower. But fuel injection was just part of the monster truck engine story. Fuel injected trucks could still only generate about a thousand horsepower. Drivers going after the wind sought another upgrade to give them the edge. The focus turned to fuel. Gasoline has a high burning temperature that limits the horsepower and puts the engine in danger of overheating. We burn gasoline, we can't run them as long as we want. They build way too much heat. But alcohol burns at a much cooler temperature and yields more power than gas. Monster truck owners decided to switch to methanol fuel. Methanol is a cooler burning fuel and you can get 20% more horsepower by just switching to methanol from gasoline. Today, methanol is the industry standard for monster trucks, but there's one drawback. In comparison to gasoline, you need twice as much methanol to get the same amount of energy. The motor can burn upwards of six to seven gallons of fuel in a 300 foot race. These things can eat some serious fuel if you let them. Fuel injected methanol powered engines make 1500 horsepower a monster truck reality. That's almost twice as powerful as a Formula One race car and seven times as powerful as a standard pickup.
to take something from a dead start to you know to 60 mile an hour, 50 mile an hour, that's pretty pretty impressive, especially something that weighs 10,000 pounds. That's pretty cool. But it takes more than horsepower to win a race. With the engine in place, the team has four weeks of build time left. They still have to install the seat, body, and tires. Now they move on to one of the most critical steps, the transmission. Okay, this one's a three-speed transmission. So if we're outdoors and you need some RPMs for a long track, we can gear up there a little bit and use all three gears in a transmission. The transmission is one part that was modified for the very first monster truck. From the beginning, monster trucks were equipped with a manual transmission specially designed to work without a clutch. To this day, the transmission allows monster truck drivers to shift gears at lightning speed, up to three times a second. It's an upgrade they can't do without. We shift them so fast, it's just that quick. I mean, it's because in a matter of 30, 40 feet, we're in third gear already when we're going down the tracks. So, I mean, you've got to be able to shift them. You've got to be able to shift them quick. With the axles, engine, and transmission all in place, it's time to move on to the front and rear steering systems. Before rear steering was made standard in monster trucks in the late 70s, they were ungainly and unpredictable. The monster trucks are so big that just maneuverability, get them out of your trailers, into these small buildings that you perform in, trucks have to be somewhat a little contortionist. With rear wheel steering, it's a whole new world. In most vehicles, the back wheels are in a fixed position. In a monster truck with rear steering, the back wheels are capable of turning independently of the front wheels. In a turn, the rear wheels are set in the opposite direction as the front wheels, dramatically reducing the turning radius of the truck. Here's how rear steering is set up. Hydraulic hoses lead to the rear axle, but the control itself is a simple toggle switch. Here we have the switch for the rear steering. The driver can put his hand on the shifter and operate the transmission and steer the rear end at the same time. As monster truck drivers begin a turn, they flick the switch left or right to set the direction of the back wheels. After the turn, the wheels will straighten out automatically. But you got to have rear steering. If you didn't have the rear steering, it'd almost be like driving a train or something. You know, you'd have to make big swings. Next, how do you stop an out-of-control monster truck when the driver is unconscious? It's as simple as pressing a button. Next. Roy Hooser and his team are eight weeks into the monster truck build. In two weeks, Bigfoot 16 will go head-to-head -head with the toughest trucks in the country in front of thousands of fans. Still to come, the fiberglass body and tires. But right now, the focus is on safety. It's time to install the seat and the harness. Monster trucks, by their design, are intended to fly. Once it leaves the ground, gravity takes over, and that can be a big situation for monster truck drivers. For a monster truck driver, torn muscles, burns, and broken bones were just part of a regular day at the office. It used to be like being in a car wreck three times a week for a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday show. I had two shoulder operations since from those years back then. I've always taken that compression hit when I hit cars. When I would take a hit, my arm would immediately go numb. Yeah, it would go dead for five seconds, 10 seconds. It finally dawned on me that I have to stop doing this. Rollovers, collisions, unpredictable fire. Together, they made monster truck racing a trick. Big changes were in order. We don't mind hurting the trucks. We don't like to hurt our drivers. Bob said, OK, that's it. We're not racing. We're not doing anything heavy until we figure out what to do about the people. 
his first move was to create the Monster Truck Racing Association, an organization that mandated safety measures for every monster truck in competition. The MTRA's biggest goal is to make sure that every monster truck that runs is safety certified. One piece of equipment required for certification is the five-point harness, like the ones used by NASCAR drivers. We run a beard racing seat, a five-point harness, and these are basically a shoulder straps. Usually zip that up first, it helps too. Shoulder straps, then of course two lap belts, a crotch belt, another shoulder one, and your other lap belt. It's designed to completely immobilize the upper body of the driver. That way, the roll cage absorbs the force of a crash, not the passenger. There's a quick release mechanism on there, which is real big. So if there's a rollover or a fire, you want to be able to disengage that entire harness system. And to combat methanol fires, a multi-layer protective suit was introduced. And this suit is designed to give him about 15 to 25 seconds of protection away from a fire. And there was one more innovation that actually cut down on accidental collisions. This clear plastic floor panel allows drivers to see what or who is below them when they're in the air. So I used to drive with my head out the window so I could see what I was doing because you can't see through the floor of a steel body monster truck. You don't want to run over anything you're not supposed to run over, but also you want to make sure that you know where the truck is in relation to anything else on that field where you're racing. Those technologies took care of the drivers, but what about the fans? If a driver is knocked unconscious during a race, there's nothing to stop vehicles from careening into the stands. I sign my life on the line when I go to compete. There's people in the stands that don't. They're there to be entertained, so their safety is the most important. So how do you stop a five-ton truck that's out of control? The remote ignition interrupter. When a driver can't shut off his own engine, an official on the sidelines can do it for him with this radio device. The receiver is built right into the cab of the monster truck. It sends a signal to the cab, to the receiver, and it takes away the spark to the engine. If a driver does roll over or get knocked unconscious, the idea is that once you're able to take that spark away from the engine, the truck will just roll to a dead stop. All these technological innovations allow monster trucks to take risks without risking lives. There's been a couple other times where they've used RIIs on me. So the first thing you do is look what's going on and what has happened. Why were we shut off? You know, as a driver, we know to look for that. That's part of our job. Now, as the monster truck continues to evolve, a monster truck driver doesn't have as many injuries as he may have had in the past. Back at the garage, Roy and the crew are attaching Bigfoot's body. And it's not a moment too soon. The truck has to drive out of the garage and straight to the race in less than a week. Come on down. The team lowers Bigfoot 16's custom painted skin onto the chassis. The airbrushing costs as much as $6,000, but the look is instantly recognizable to Bigfoot fans. In early monster trucks, the chassis and body were fused together, so any damage to the body required a major rebuild. As we progressed doing car crashes, we were wrecking our trucks more often, and the metal bodies are a major problem when you have to fix them. But today's fiberglass bodies go onto the truck separately and are designed to be easily removed and easily replaced. You just put some mounts, slide them fiberglass body on, you've got a vehicle that uh, looks good until you roll it next time and stick another body on it.
The tires are the last part to go onto the new Bigfoot truck. Once these mountains of rubber are on, the truck will be fully functional and ready to hit the racetrack. These tires, with their close to 20-foot circumference, cost $1,500 each. The signature of a monster truck is the 66-inch tires. It's what makes a monster truck a monster truck. Bob may have begun with standard tractor tires, but today, monster truck tires are specially designed for maximum traction on the race course. Drivers need as much grip as possible to transmit the enormous power produced by the engine through the wheels to the track. The huge surface area combined with the deep, angled grooves on the tires maximize speed and agility. When these tires hit dirt, their traction allows them to dig in. The type of tires they used in monster trucks actually have grooves, and uh, uh, you, so you have a combination of a large contact area and this grooved surface that allows you to not lose contact and maintain grip. The secret is in the way each tire is hand carved. The edge that he cuts here gives a better bite, and each of my drivers kind of cuts their own tire, and they, they change this for their application. This hand carving technique can take up to 40 hours per tire. Each unique cut is derived from the driver's needs. The diagonal cuts on these tires will help wick away any mud encountered during a race. Get a brand new tire back to the shop and you start cutting and grooving and, and what, you know, you, you look at what other guys do and, and uh, you think maybe, maybe if we cut a little bit different, you know, maybe it'd work a little bit better. But, uh, but you can do a lot with the tire. The crew rolls the truck carefully out of the garage on temporary transport tires. Rotate it a little bit. Today at Bigfoot 4x4, it's finally time to put down the tools. After 10 weeks of non-stop construction, this monster is complete. The new truck must get on the road to make it to the Vermont finals on time. There's no time to backtrack or second guess. The crew can only hope their creation is up to the challenge. Coming up, will Bigfoot 16 return home a winner or will it be shipped back for repairs? Here at the Champlain Valley State Fairgrounds outside Burlington, Vermont, the New England four-wheel jamboree is underway. I like the fact that the monster trucks are loud and fast and puts on a good show. Everybody wants to win this show. All right. All right. And there's only one guy going to, you know, and it, it just makes it tough. The pressure's on when we go out there. We got a reputation up, oh, and we're going to do our best to do that. Dan Runty hopes he has the edge with the brand new, fully loaded Bigfoot. It took 10 weeks of non stop labor from a crew of master mechanics. They've staked their reputation on how the truck performs here today. But taking an untested truck into competition could be a disaster. Just because it's a new truck, I'm not going to go out here and lay down for anybody. I'm not. It's not in my blood, and it's not in our vocabulary back at the shop either, for that matter. I mean, we run them as hard as we can run them. Dan is racing against the best. This event has drawn some of the best-loved monster trucks in the country. My favorite monster truck is the Avenger because he's really good at freestyling. My favorite monster truck is the Raminator. It's louder than all the other ones. Among the fan favorites are the Dodge trucks, Raminator and Rammy Mission, driven by Mark Hall and his brother-in-law, Dale Benier. Every one of these guys runs hard, they run strong. They got good teams behind them. Everybody's got good equipment, got good power. I don't look past anybody. The main competitor is going to be a big foot for us. He's a really good driver. He's been around for a long time, so we'll try to go after him. The Avenger, with its distinctive 57 Chevy body, is owned and operated by Jim Kohler. 
everybody that you, you'll see on a monster truck show has the potential of winning that show. It's just if they want us, they want to make it happen that day. If it's in the rhythm form, if it's in the cards, the luck of the draw, whatever, it's there. Everyone wants to win, but with its reputation as the original monster truck, Bigfoot has the most to lose. One of the day's events is the freestyle. A brazen display of jumps, spins, and tricks that showcase a driver's skill and win support from the crowd. You're out there by yourself, you're the jumps, you just become one with the track, you and the truck just flow. You can do donuts, you can do sky wheelies, slap wheelies, you know, sky it out. Fresh out of the shop, it's Bigfoot 16's first competition test. competition begins. Side-by-side -side racing on this 200-foot course. Today we're going to race in a straight line, which is, which is really cool. It's just like you'd see at the drag strip, except in our race, and instead of just running down a flat track, uh, there's a jump in the way, and then there's like four or five cars in the way, too, that you got to go over. When we go out to race, it's the first one's always tough. You're just not really sure what everything's going to do. And, and being, you know, new truck and stuff, it's it's going to be a little different today. Bigfoot takes on Ramunition. The second jump almost topples Ramunition, and Bigfoot crosses the finish line first. In the next qualifying run, it's Raminator versus Nightmare. Raminator's win means it will go up against Bigfoot in the finals. Do I get nervous? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, it, you know, the pressure's there. The pressure as well as the name and upholding what we've got. This is it. The trucks line up nose to nose. Raminator can't get off the ground, and the cars slow him down. And Bigfoot wins by a split second. We brought the truck out for the first time today, you know, and after several rounds of racing, we, we actually ended up winning. We got great guys at the shop. We've been at this for 30 years, and just to come right out of the box and do that, it's just awesome, you know. We couldn't ask for a better day, actually. My favorite monster truck is Bigfoot because he's really fast at racing. Bigfoot is uh, the king of monster. He's just got the technology, the, the money to back it, and he never fails. He's always on the throttle. From the humble beginnings of a St. Louis auto shop to gravity-defying glory, monster trucks have evolved to push the envelope of the sport and test the limits of technology. People that come with that idea that they're just going to go see a great big old truck, and then once they kind of get in there and they see how it works, they think, whoa, wait a minute, this, there is a lot more to this than what I, what I thought. People love big, fast vehicles. Everybody loves horsepower and speed. It's the automotive nation. It's where we build things. It's where we make cars. People love that because it's just showing the true grit of America on what you can do to make things happen. Monster truck builders and drivers will keep on innovating, upgrading, and attempting the impossible to make sure these machines are always larger than life.